Well, good day, everybody, and welcome to a financial services webinar in Safe Hands, the future of financial services in 2020. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm the executive chairman of Zen Group, and it is my uh, privilege to welcome uh, Patricia Lustig and Jill Ringland, two dear friends of mine, uh, onto today's program to talk uh, about the future of financial services. So welcome, Jill. Thank you. And welcome, Patricia. Thank you. Great. Uh, just before we get cracking, uh, as ever, I think it's always important to thank our sponsors. Uh, without our sponsors, uh, this work that we're able to do simply wouldn't be possible. I'm extremely conscious that many of our sponsors, particularly those in financial services, will have a true vested interest in what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm also conscious that many of our sponsors who are in the technology areas are equally involved in financial services and concerned with where things are heading, uh, not least in areas like fintech, etc. Today, uh, as ever, is timely, as uh, so many of us know, uh, about COVID-19. But this uh, study today is based on work uh, that was done back uh, in 2011 and 2012 in conjunction with Long Finance and led uh, by Jill working with Patricia on what uh, things would look like. That resulted in a study called In Safe Hands, which is available uh, on the website, as are, of course, uh, details about Patricia and Jill, the work that they do, and in fact, their latest book, which I have no doubt they might just briefly mention at some point. Uh, well, with no further ado, if I may, we're going to do the usual thing here, which is uh, get me out of your way and get on to them. Uh, both Patricia and Jill have got about uh, 20 minutes or so to chat. And then we've got adequate time for questions. Please do just use the question facility to send your questions to me, and I will field them uh, to, to uh, Jill and to Patricia after they've made their presentation. Jill, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next slide. So, uh, I shouldn't have said next slide. Could you go back? There we go. Uh, the way we're going to be handling this is uh, Trisha and I are going to alternate. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the, some of the conclusions we came to in the report. Um, Patricia is going to be picking up at various points with, okay, so how does this look in 2020? Next slide, please. As Michael said, we wrote the report. Well, the work on the report was done about 10 years ago and it was published in January 2012. And We've subsequently used the work with all sorts of organizations to help them think about their strategic planning, check their assumptions, and it's, it's lasted pretty well. For instance, one of the uh, questions we asked was, would the Washington Consensus uh, persist? And I think recent events suggest that the answer is probably no. So, what we're going to do is ask what has changed since 2012? What's the long-term trends and are the scenarios that we developed, scenarios for 2015, are they still useful? Next slide, please. Over to Patricia. Here is the outline of the agenda that we will follow. First, Jill will examine the long-term trends that we identified in the report. And I will comment on their validity in 2020. Then Jill will briefly describe the scenarios from 2050 from the report. And I will comment on their utility in 2020. And finally, we will draw out some conclusions before we start question and answer. Next slide, please. The long-term trends that we identified back 10 years ago are probably pretty um, well understood now, so I'm not going to labour them. Uh, it's about the global population increasing and getting older, uh, new financial centres coming up with different value systems, technology, 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 and technology. And, of course, worries about the ecological, energy, and environmental limits as more people have the right and the means to travel, eat meat, use electricity. And so 
Those were the long-term trends we identified in the report. And then, in a minute, we'll think about how well they have survived. Over to the next slide, please. Those trends were thought in the report to have some impact on financial services. With an older population, clearly an older population may well be risk averse. And also an interesting one is that household wealth and firms traditionally have been transferred by people maybe in their 60s to people in their 30s or 40s. Increasingly, this is going to be from people in their 80s and 90s to people in their 60s and 70s, which has enormous impact on the uh, property market, the investment market. The changing balance of economic and political power, I think that's absolutely clear that uh, financial services, so much of the innovation in financial services is now coming out of Asia. Uh, the impacts of ICT, uh, we identified really three main headings. Fintech, and of course Fintech is absolutely getting the headlines, uh, lots of interest, and it's, a, it's about retail banking mostly and transactions. Uh, we thought that insurance would decline because ICT allows risk to be better quantified and insurance, of course, is sharing risk. And we thought this would cover property, health, avoidance of vehicle collisions, infrastructure, and so on. And finally, we thought that ICT enables uh, homogeneous global financial systems. And homogeneous systems are liable to be more volatile than heterogeneous systems. And finally, we thought that uh, insurance would not be available to shelter from the volatility of the natural systems uh, resulting from uh, climate change. Next slide. Over to Are these, are these trends useful today in 2020? The red indicates what we see today. The first trend we looked at was global population, and there is now very good, strong evidence that it could peak at about 8.5 billion before starting to fall. And this is because of higher levels of women's literacy, and as more and more people move to cities and, and have urban living, their families become smaller. Most of the additional people will be in Africa and Asia, um, living in cities, and the expanded middle class in Asia has revolutionized many consumer markets. The shrinking and aging population in East Asia and Europe are changing social structures, and we're not finished with that yet. That will go on for a while. The next trend on financial centers and the unshared value systems, um, that's yes, the Washington consensus has actually shattered. Changes from technology, also yes. One of the most impacted is the insurance industry, whose woes have been increased by the COVID-19 pandemic. For instance, not repaying travel insurance for canceled trips, or trying to keep the money so that they force people to fly later on when they may not wish to. Let's now look at the global scenarios for 2050. Oh, uh, excuse me, sorry. I've missed one. Can you go back? I've missed in term the ecological and energy and environmental limits that are tested or breached. Here in London, the explosion of travel by the new Asian middle class has, has been very visible, and the effect of Asian consumers' new patterns of energy and food consumption has modified supply chains globally. The economic effect of COVID-19 is expected to be particularly severe on the new middle classes, which are the ones, particularly Asians, who have driven the global economy for the past decade. So now we can look at the global scenarios for 2050. Over to you, Jill. Thank you, Tricia. The scenarios that we developed in the report uh, use two axes. One new forms of governance or no change. And so we thought that under second hand, uh, which is where 
it's a bit like now that a lot of institutions have decayed. Uh, that was when the Washington Consensus sort of staggered along. Under globalization, we thought that some crash would have happened from the volatility of a homogeneous global system by about 2030. And thinking about it today, uh, we think that really it's time to think about new forms of governance. And so what we're going to do is talk a bit more about city societies and affinity groups. Now, these in the report were called, I think, many hands and long hands. But we found that working with a number of groups as we did, that um, city societies and affinity groups really were more intuitive names. So that's what we're going to uh, use to describe them now. Next slide, please. Describing the city societies in a bit more detail. What we thought was that it could be 50, maybe 100 loosely coupled city-states with diverse regulatory regimes. And that society would really form around city-states, so that cities would be wealth clusters, they'd have different brands. This would happen because nation-states had essentially failed, uh, because a lot of nation-states are built around political structures with a weighting towards the historic rural economy. And we could see that not all city-states would be based on democracy and capitalism and Western values, and that the uh, infrastructure built around these, like the UN, would disappear. And this means that it's really difficult to see how to construct global commons with conflicts in values and fewer implicit norms. Next slide, please. So, what's the implication for financial services? Uh, the first thing to say, of course, is there's no mechanism for handling global risk. You can speculate that um, investment outside the home state, city state would be discouraged. Uh, that uh, wealthy states would be able to provide pensions and state services, and uh, to treat, uh, trade with other city states to ensure security of supply and uh, security of resources like energy and water. The important thing about city societies is that trust is within the geography. And so even retail banking, which is pretty transactional, is mostly contained within the city state. And we were looking at how uh, the financial services hubs might um, develop in this scenario. And, and we felt that maybe there'd be five, half a dozen uh, preeminent hubs, and that for financial services, these might uh, cooperate to provide uh, a regulatory framework. Next slide, please. Are, is city society, that scenario, useful in 2020? In the short term, the disruptive effects of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic mean that the role of nation states and regional governments have been highlighted, and the best track record has been small and or city states. We've got Singapore, we've got New Zealand, we've got Hong Kong, Taiwan, Israel, and Iceland. Interestingly, of the six, four of them have um, women prime ministers. You can take that how you'd like. In the longer term, rural and urban societies will diverge further, strengthening the power and reach of, of the cities. There will be a big difference between cities with static declining and aging populations that may well be wealthy and growing cities in Africa and parts of Asia which have a large proportion of young and often immigrant residents and will probably struggle, not necessarily, but probably, probably, to provide work and services for their people. Next slide, please. Jill? Switching now to talk about affinity groups. 
In the affinity group scenario, uh, this, this is harder to envisage. And we found that in working with group, uh, people who had grown up with IT absolutely understood affinity groups. People who, who were uh, less IT literate couldn't understand how trust could build up within an affinity group over a distance using virtual connections. But it's a useful mental concept. And it's about loosely coupled transnational systems with diverse regulatory regimes. We originally thought about the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Uh, we, you could think about uh, uh, Muslim uh, communities now. Uh, you can think about communities in Latin America spanning country boundaries. But in this scenario, society has reformed around affinity groups uh, with uh, nation states having much diminished uh, competence. And in each geographic area, multiple value systems would be accommodated and all sorts of complex arrangements of nation states and communities with affinity groups will emerge. Again, in this scenario, international issues, uh, say regulations, systemic challenges, because nation states have far less capability, uh, it probably will be a complex of uh, nation states and affinity groups that needs to tackle international issues. Quite, quite complex. Next slide, please. So, in affinity groups, uh, the investment outside the home group is discouraged. Uh, affinity groups span geographies, and so retail banking uh, through intelligent financial advisors is within uh, trust groups, which are affinity groups. And in this scenario, we thought that probably uh, London and New York uh, could be the preeminent financial services hub because they've got diverse resident communities. I think it's 270 nationalities in London. So next slide. Is affinity groups useful in 2020? In the short term, one of the side effects of the pandemic has been to weaken ties between affinity groups by increasing the importance of locality. You've probably heard about local people setting up groups to help others, those who can't get around with COVID-19. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. In the longer term, ICT links underpin affinity groups across national boundaries and the urban-rural divide. Think about wealth transfers, so remittances from people who work outside the country, and investments. Next slide, please. For our conclusions, we, we looked at, well, what have we learned? The first big surprise was the end of population growth. We hadn't considered that it would stop and start falling so quickly. The second was that while we anticipated the Washington consensus breaking, we didn't think it would happen as quickly as it has. The spread of COVID-19 has highlighted the downsides of globalization and is probably causing its rollback. The role of technology is much more complex than was understood in 2012. For instance, the power of global platforms and what's called surveillance capitalism. And finally, the insurance industry is looking very shaky indeed in ways that we didn't totally foresee. Chill. Next slide, please. So, thinking about the scenarios, they're not forecast, but they're useful models. And we've used them and they helped check people's assumptions and allow them to articulate those and share them. That's really all we wanted to say. So uh, over to Michael for the Q&A. Well, fantastic. It was uh, really good. And what I liked is the two of you sticking so beautifully to time that we do have a time for questions. And that's important because the board is firing up here with quite a few. We've got uh, nearly 60 people on the line. Uh, so there are quite a few uh, comments and questions. 
Uh, just before we get going, um, you didn't do it, uh, possibly while you stayed in time. Uh, do you want to just talk a little bit about your forthcoming book on uh, mega global trends? Okay. So back a couple of years ago, we did a book called Getting to 2032, Mega Trends and How to Deal with Them. And this took a fairly defensive view of global trends, which is what a lot of people are taking. Uh, you know, thinking of them as fearful trends and how do you prevent them uh, getting on top of you. Uh, that was an interesting book because uh, thinking of 2032 is when both in the US and China there is going to be a change of government. So that was why 2032. But actually, then we st stood back and we thought, actually, the, the problem with 2032 is it's too near. Uh, in order to stretch the imagination and look at opportunities, it's much better to extend through to 2040. And so we've uh, been developing uh, uh, the trends through to 2040, which gives you a whole range of new things that could evolve over that time scale. And we had got it ready to send off and COVID hit. And so, Trish, we're in a rewrite, aren't we? Yes, we are. Okay. It's, it's becoming something slightly different, but we still want the positive slant that there's an awful lot of opportunities that we can take. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, well, a couple of things. You made a, a point in there uh, on the affinity groups that you'd drawn analogies with the Catholic Church, particularly in the medieval era. Uh, Bob McDowell kicks off with a really good question here. Do you see any analogies between the growth and operation of the Greek city-states and your forecast of growth in city-states? Uh, Bob does, of course, note that the city-states were ultimately overtaken by the uh, emerging Roman Empire. But uh, any quick comments there on an analogy between those two? I, I think that one of the interesting things is uh, the discussion of scale. Uh, Patricia mentioned it. You know, when she was thinking about successful states that are uh, dealing with COVID, they're all small. And so uh, in an era of better transport and better electronic communication, maybe the connections in a sort of five million thing is roughly the same with the same emergence of people who understand each other and can talk to each other about issues as it was in the Greek city states. Um, still uh, sticking to affinity groups a little bit longer, Hugh Purser asks an interesting question. Is there any kind of legal structure that does or could uh, define affinity groups or the relationship between them? I, I can't think of one that comes to mind. Jill, you? Um, I guess the nearest is... Um the um, the legal structure behind Sharia law. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Interesting yeah. point. Yeah, that's a that's a particularly good analogy. Uh, given a couple of things that we're working on at the moment, uh, where we're mm -hmm. trying to explore um, what Sharia and other uh, religions of the book have to teach us about the ways in which communities believe that they ought to be organized, taking mm -hmm. effectively the Bible as a, you know, 600 BC manual of good practice, which is, but I think there are things that you can discern from the Bible. For example, you need to understand uh, what the intention is of the person you're entering an agreement with. You should never have a transaction with somebody you don't know. There should be risk mm -hmm. sharing. There are actually quite a few uh, mm -hmm. things you could distill mm -hmm. from it. They're all interpretive, but mm -hmm. not religious interpretive, but societal interpretive. Yeah, sure. Interesting. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a, uh, quite, quite a few questions here. Uh, an interesting one from Esteban Esquivel. Uh, as teleworking gains importance, especially after this pandemic, what are the implications for cities, especially ones where living costs are prohibitive? Oh, so, gosh. You, know, you, you did focus on your, your two uh, hubs being London and New York because of the diversity of their communities. But uh, please, please, thoughts on that? That one, um, we... We look at, and you can see this already happening. I mean, Twitter said that all their staff could continue to work from home if they wish. And as people discover that they actually really 
perhaps really like working from home or would like more time to work from home, there's a potential that office space starts to become redundant and not needed. And that can have a real knock-on effect for real estate, office real estate in big cities. Well, a, a trailer that we're going to have an entire session in early June with Victoria Ward and Caitlin McDonald, uh, who brought out uh, a report recently called Remotely Human, where which I think is a great title, where they're going to explore the future of the workplace. So uh, just a trailer for that. Um, we've got some interesting questions here on um, uh, from Shan Turnbull. Uh, might corporations providing benefits to all their uh, stakeholders, as proposed by, uh, as you'll know, the U.S. Business Roundtable CEOs, become an affinity group to promote common global goods? That's, that's a good example. of uh, One of the older examples we had was guilds. And this is absolutely a modern equivalent of a guild, isn't it? Uh, not that it's based on a specific industry, but it's based on a, a specific frame of reference and set of common assumptions. And the need for uh, each of them to have the same sort of things in their environment, like, you know, decent infrastructure, decent schools, and so on. So it's a really good example. Thank you. Um, Jabir Walji uh, is dialing in, I believe, from Dubai, and he's asking, Dubai is a city-state. What are your thoughts on it uh, because of COVID-19, uh, pro or against, and moving forward to 2050? I know really nothing about Dubai. Uh, I don't know whether Trisha does. I couldn't comment. Uh, same here. I've traveled through it quite recently, in fact, but um, I'm not an expert in that area. Okay. Well, Sorry. what I love, what I love is candor and honesty rather than speculating. <laughs> but I've got another question here, which I think will allow you to, to maybe not talk about Dubai specifically, but uh, some of the uh, legacies. So uh, there are two questions, really. I'll take them together. They're, they're related. And Jabir has come back saying, okay. So that, that, it's, <laughs> Sorry. It's no, it's yeah. just fine. It's far better. Uh, uh, so what we've got is David Lai has asked one question. And he's asking about your thoughts on the impact of COVID-19 on urbanization with two prompts. Uh, do mega cities still look like a generally good idea? And can traditional cities like London or New York adapt to a post-COVID, post-crash world? So hold those two. Mega cities, good idea. What about London and New York? Meanwhile, uh, Roger James makes another point. The scenarios make the case for the cities. Can you think of a rural fight back, both in economic half, but also in real resource or even military conflict? Okay. Uh, so, uh, do you want to take that one, or shall I? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can at least make a start on it because it's quite complex to put the two of them together. I think that the way I don't think that um, large cities, mega cities, are going to go away. But I think that perhaps the way we live in them will change. And I think things like um, what kind of real estate is sought after and the kind of real estate that doesn't have an outside, doesn't have some way to get outside as part of the flat or home, is going to be less valuable than one that has even a balcony so people can get outside. Think about people with children in high-rise apartments right now in London who cannot go outside. And when you've got seven-year-old boys, as a friend of mine does, that, that's very difficult indeed. Hmm. So I think that's one of the things that will change. And potentially the way we, so it's not just how we live in cities, but the way we use cities will change. But I don't think, um, I don't know, Jill, what, what do you think? I don't think we'll lose mega cities. I think you're right that um, mega cities will increasingly become diverse uh, clusters of villages. I mean, London's a set of villages, uh, Mexico City's a set of villages. Uh, and I think one of the emphases going forward will be uh, developing the villages with better internal connections and more green space. I think that's going to be something that comes out of um, thinking about climate change and also uh, reacting to the pandemic. And then on the... Sorry? 
No, no, I was just going to say in the rule, but you go ahead. I'll, I'll fill in afterwards. Okay. Um, you go ahead. Okay, but so rule is interesting, isn't it? Because it means different things in different parts of the world. Globally, uh, people are leaving the land because they have an image of life, which is much better than the one they've got, and they move. Now, in the next 20, 30 years, I suspect that's going to continue. Uh, it'll take at least that long for uh, people to understand the advantages of living in the city and the advantages of living in the country and make decisions about what trade-off they want. Uh, um, and I guess the other factor is, of course, with decreasing family size, there won't be the same pressure for the surplus kids to migrate to the city. And so there may well be um, a return to the country rather than the aging of rural areas, which is what we see at the moment. I think to add two more things, there is potentially a kickback in the sense that um, living in a rural area, you are potentially safer than living in a city because of population density. And there will be people who take that opportunity. And then there are also issues around food security and what that means for nations and how they handle that. Okay. Well, we've got to, just moving on a little bit, um, could you refresh my memory? What did you say, if anything, about alternative currencies, cryptocurrencies, etc., back in uh, 2012? What we said in the report uh, was that um, certainly we started thinking about cryptocurrencies uh, very much in the uh, framework of alternative investment methods uh, with crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, and would that use conventional currencies or would it use cryptocurrency? But it was very early days, and uh, I think we grossly underestimated both of those things. Uh, Trevor Hilder would like you to speculate. What do you think of the possibility of new forms of money emerging? That's not that not just necessarily cryptocurrencies. That was me putting that on. Uh, mm -hmm. And the current monetary monoculture, which uh, is fixated on nationally issued currencies. Yeah. Uh, of course, there has been a breakdown in nationally issued currency, you know, the euro. And what we've seen is that actually, money does seem to be tied to your, your political and social arrangements in terms of how it's handled. And so I think that uh, the breakdown of currency is going to be related to the breakdown of a national infrastructure. And it might be, you know, you having a national currency is um, keeps nation states, nation states. And if you don't have a national currency, what does that mean for nation states? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I think the, I think the COVID um, pandemic has shown that um, being a nation state at the moment is very much linked to defense of the borders, protection of the people and public health issues. And that seems to be much stronger than even defense of industry, defense of, um, against immigrants, which is an interesting reversal of all sorts of trends. Okay. Um, Sean Turbull, again, is, is interested in what degree will geographical endowments of sustainable energy sources determine the type and value of services, if at all, given the increasing effects of rising oceans and pollution. Uh, this is also a point that's intrigued me. Uh, the Internet is responsible in many ways for the current response via home working, etc., a, a decentralized system originally supposedly designed to handle a nuclear uh, holocaust of some form and still keep moving. Uh, and now we see this uh, rise towards decentralized grids. Do you not feel that is actually uh, a centripetal force uh, for city growth? Uh, no, I, I don't see that um, with renewables, uh, you've moved away from a source on fossil fuels, and so it's actually much easier to imagine 
how a city state could uh, have its own energy sources by thinking about the different dimensions they might use as their raw materials. And so different city states would have different energy sources and would uh, use different sorts of renewables at different rates. I mean, and I different, think it's, it works okay. And Sorry. different energy mixes, and it's one of the um, positive things that we talk about in transitioning energy, that there are many examples of very small electricity generation just like that, that might not even be city-wide, but might be neighborhood-wide. Mm -hmm. uh, Patricia, uh, given the nature of the club, uh, which has a, a strong component of tech and finance, uh, you made a particular point about uh, the sh fragility, shakiness of the insurance sector. Uh, I wouldn't mind you just spending 30 seconds recapping why you see that. Then I'm going to move on to a question from Bob McDowell again. Okay, part of that was around the ability to to um, be more, I think the word is predictive. In other words, the uh, artificial intelligence helps us be much more sure, so it's not a risk we can forecast much easier than we used to. And artificial intelligence also leads to better safety in cars, the collision uh, um, avoidance and things like that. And it was around that, and then looking at what's happening with uh, insurance companies just saying, well, throwing up their hands and saying, well, we can't pay it, we won't pay it. That doesn't make people feel like they want to use them. Mm. Jill, what was the other one? There were three. No, 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 that was me, but uh, let me oh, go okay. on to Bob's question. Will Sorry. insurance decline, or will that be partially offset by an increase in self-insurance? Uh. I don't know what self-insurance means. Do you mean saving? Question, genuine question. Um, I'm going to have to interpret for Bob, but I think, uh, yes, basically self-insurance of most forms would involve you saving up for a rainy day. Mm -hmm. I think those who can afford to do it will. Mm. Uh, I mean, for instance, you know, I know a number of my friends who used to have medical insurance. And the medical insurance companies just started trying to find ways of not paying. And they will just stop paying and have a savings account instead. And, you know, if you can afford to do it, you will. And the, uh, but the other question is, of course, for the people who uh, can't afford to have savings and have relied on state services. You know, the direction of state services is very um, difficult to see over the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be an area of, of quite a bit of discussion. Uh, Lloyd's mm -hmm. made some announcements, I think it was yesterday, uh, that this is the most they're going to have ever paid out in a year since 9-11, uh, mm -hmm. and I think or maybe it even yeah. exceeds that, certainly mm -hmm. early days. We've got huge controversies here in the United Kingdom and in America over business interruption insurance. So mm -hmm. there's quite a bit of change. And I, mm -hmm. I wonder if there's sort of a dividing line. There's the kind of the predictive insurance that you're talking about uh, Patricia, which of course obviates the idea that there's pooling because I can price it so mm -hmm. accurately that I exclude right. you or mm -hmm. price it so accurately that you don't find it useful to have. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, uh, or, yep. or we've yep. got these sort of more general uh, pooling type insurances. So a lot to go for there. Um, Eric Bierman, uh sort of starts moving us towards the end of our conversation, sadly. Uh, what do you consider the key uncertainties in your scenario analysis? Geopolitics? impact of technology, the success or failure of nation states? What are the big uncertainties for you? For us now, or, or what? From I'd the... say now, yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, I think the nation state one, um, you know, we know the Washington consensus has collapsed. What will replace it? That's a yeah. big uncertainty. Mm. You get the next uh, one, Jill. Well, I'd like to almost turn the question around. Uh, for a long while, uh, doing a uh, developing scenario was really useful because they challenged the current set of assumptions. You know, people had assumptions about steady state and, you know, this sort of uh, political and economic environment in the world. And you could raise one or two things that 
could possibly destabilize it. Hmm? Now, and I, I was on a call earlier today with a group of business people around Reading, the consensus was that nobody knew what the question was. And so in that environment, all you can do is keep your ears open, be sensitive, maybe have some hypotheses and keep testing them as, as events happen. But it isn't the, you know, there isn't a big question. There are so many big questions at the moment that um, I wouldn't want to do uh, a, a detailed scenario analysis at the moment. Uh, hence our work on trends, which allows you to think about one thing at a time rather than adding uncertainty to uncertainty. Sorry. Um, that's an interesting question here from Kartik Patel. Where do you see most wealth generation happening post COVID 19? Uh, Africa, for example? Emerging markets? Well, there are some structural reasons why it's difficult to see the creation of a middle class in Africa. And that's because so many of the economies are based around extractive industries, which don't tend to build a middle class. And, you know, wealth very much depends on having a middle class. Uh, and it could... Okay, go, go Trish. Yeah, and I was going to say that this, the new middle class in Asia, um, which within the next 40 years I think is probably where the middle class will be, um, has had a real knock from what's happened and many people will be knocked out of it and it will take quite some time for it to regain its position, I mean, in number of people as it has now, or has before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Okay, good. Well, there, there are a lot of uh, comments and questions. I'll just read them off and then ask you both to uh, maybe give me a snappy 30-second summary each. Um, Shan Turbul uh, is curious about your claim that small states manage the COVID crisis best. He's pointing to China. Uh, and I think that is a big issue on the analysis is that we here at Zen have done about is it large or small, is it federal or central, and frankly, there are all sorts of models out there. Uh, Roger James came back uh, on living in a rural environment, you are less dependent on the money system, and very many cities rely on a disproportionate contribution uh, from rural society, so in short, rural requires less, contributes more. Uh, Andrew Ross is uh, looking at the future batter, battleground of who owns the commons, the rainforest, the oceanic fish stock, ecosystem mm -hmm. services. I think that'd be a, you know, an interesting issue on, on what the new Washington consensus might look like. Mm -hmm. uh, one viewer is kind of curious about how you feel about Istanbul. Uh, Timothy Coleman has mentioned that there's a WEF report, w World Economic Forum report up on fostering effective energy transition on 2020 that's just come up and uh, Jabba Walji would like to dive into Hyperloop's uh, effect on population cities. Um, so you've obviously left the boards alight with a lot of things. We've, uh, I'll send you the uh, questions so you might get back to people if you feel like it. But, um, but just just to just to wrap up, it's been a really interesting uh, bit. Uh, the obvious question to ask is, you know, what are we going to be talking about in 2050? So I won't ask that. Uh, what I think I'd most like you to maybe summarize is, what would you most like to know now that would affect how you would predict 2050? Well, I think it has to be global governance, doesn't it? Because we've, over the last 50 years, uh, had this umbrella of, yes, there were lots of uh, small battles, small wars, but there was an assumption that there were mechanisms. And without mechanisms, it's really quite difficult. So. That, I think, is, uh, is, is the big question. Other things are much more uh, predictable. Uh, I think the demographics are going to have an enormous impact, and we can see it coming. Well, those, of you talk, the, those who talk about these things can see it coming, but governments don't seem to be able to see it coming, and a lot of the global organizations haven't seen it coming. And, and rather related to that, I, I'd love to know what's going to happen about public goods, so infrastructure like health, like education, and which way are we going to go? I know which way I'd like us to go, but getting there may not be simple. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Patricia, 
And Jill, thank you. Uh, if you could just give me just a moment to close here. It has been a great discussion. Uh, folks out there, we're going to be uh, addressing this again, believe it or not, in a most interesting way. I'll come to it in a moment. But there are many webinars in front of you. Tomorrow we have uh, two, in fact. We're going to be looking at the city of Xi'an uh, in Shanxi province. Uh, and I think that is a sign of the changes that have come because we're uh, in 2012. I seriously doubt, to, well, in fact, I know that Xi'an province, or sorry, Xi'an city, was not on the cards as a financial center. Uh, and yet we'll be talking about a city that is about 50 to 20 percent larger than London uh, that is making its mark. Uh, we also have enterprise management initiatives with the highly uh, informed David Craddock. And uh, next week we have a communities chest featuring Tim Ward of the Quoted Companies Alliance. It's going to be talking about equity versus debt and trading. However, uh, not on this chart is uh, next uh, next Wednesday, the 20th. Jill will be back as part of a very large group looking at a study that was done at Gresham College 20 years ago, uh, the future of London 2020. And here in 2020, on the 20th of May, I wish there was a 20th month, but there's not, uh, we're going to be covering that study and looking to 2040. Uh, so we'll get yet more futurology and, and insights uh, from Jill. Anyway, uh, it remains for me uh, to say thank you to both Jill and Patricia for coming forward today. I particularly liked your candor on what you didn't know. I particularly liked uh, you pointing Istanbul out as a that outlier that just never really came off. And I think it's that 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 rare and important point about being honest uh, that makes what, the work that you two do uh, something that I really admire. So thank you both, and I'll uh, give you a virtual audience clap if I may uh, to say thank you. Uh, and we hope to see both of you back again. Uh, maybe not quite in 2050, maybe a little bit ahead of, ahead of time before that. Uh, so oh, we'll that's work on that. Mm -hmm. yes. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Michael. Thank you.